your guide to the truth. The new American media dot com. Broadcasting to you live from the Milky Way galaxy, the solar system, planet Earth, North America, the United States of America, California, Los Angeles. To be specific, hello everybody, this is Brian Engelman, and you are listening to Agree to Disagree here on the TNAM Radio Network, because the news always matters, here at thenewamericanmedia.com. Thank you for joining us as we cruise through to almost our half-decade mark on the air. May Day is essentially our unofficial birthday. It's hard to exactly pinpoint a birthday when it was like the website went up one day and then Twitter went up and then YouTube went up and there's all these different dates, but May Day is essentially the easiest way to remember it. It's been quite an interesting journey, one of the one of the excursions that we have embarked upon included going out to Las Vegas, Nevada, about an hour away, what was that, Bunkerville, hour and a half away, to the Bundy Ranch, back about, what was that, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, and we met this man named Pete Santilli, Pete was a journalist, a, a, a radio talk show host, and he was the one that recorded the Bundy Ranch Riot video that went viral. There were people in the road, there were federal agents, people were getting tased and knocked to the ground, and dogs were being sicked on people, weapons were aimed, and it was really tense. So we went out there to see what was going on. And this story kind of spilled into what we saw in Oregon recently, a couple months ago recently with the shooting death, some say the killing of LaVoy Finnicum, and an ambush came out of the car with his hands up, that much is certain. When his hands came down, was he reaching for a weapon or was he already shot at that point? We don't have the audio. Astonishing, in 2016 we don't have the audio for that. You know, if we want to have faith in our justice system, we need to have faith in the people executing... (laughs) Well, some people are saying that he was executed. I've watched the video, the jury's still out for me. I haven't made a, a final determination on it. However, after the killing of Lavoie Finnegan, several people were arrested. Clive and Bundy flew up there, and he was subsequently arrested. Ammon Bundy was arrested. Uh, Several people were arrested, including talk show host and journalist Pete Santilli. Now, our friend Ford Fisher from News to Share is coming on the program today because he reached out to Mr. Pete Santilli, and Pete wrote him back. So he addressed a letter to him in prison, and we have an exclusive interview with Pete Santilli Ford Fisher of News to Share. I'm eager to get into the uh, the nuts and bolts of what was said, what was asked, the whole process. We'll probably have Ford uh, kind of hit reset and give us as much of the background info as possible on this Oregon standoff story. And of course, all of the people that were there, they have now, uh, what would you say, they, they have surrendered, they have ended the occupation. There's no more bloodshed, um, you know, and that was one of my main things. One of one of the main reasons why I wanted to go to Bundy Ranch is the, this thing was spiraling out of control, and uh, it, you know, it, it's a it's a bit of a complicated, nuanced case uh, about federal government overreach and the Bureau of Land Management. It's it's there's a lot to this story, um, but we went out there because we figured the more cameras that were there the less likely it would be that somebody would get an itchy trigger finger. Itchy trigger finger, if you know what I mean. Um, We're actually working on a lighting project in our neighborhood, and and the phrase, cockroaches hate sunlight, has been used quite a few times. You know, you you illuminate your area, and there's less shadowy places for things to happen. 
consider the uh, the new American media, the new American journalist, the new American talk show host. You know, it's anybody with a cell phone. It's anybody with a camera. It's anybody on Stitcher, or Spreaker. Or, you know, you can find any any app these days to communicate with the masses. It's brilliant. However, the lines can get blurred from time to time. Is this person an activist? Is this person a journalist? <laughs> interesting. It's going to be interesting talking to Ford because Ford was also arrested in Baltimore covering those riots. You remember that? And law enforcement sometimes has a hard time differentiating between who is press and who is not. Now, now let me say, Ford Fisher had clear-cut lanyards, press credentials, you can see in the video. He's, he's very well identified as media. Here's who I am, here's my name, here's my information, here's the outlet I work for, blah, blah, blah. Pete Santilli was, what was he, he was wearing a, uh, a vest that said press, I believe it said press. You know, clearly identifying himself. Now, I did the same thing at, uh, at Bundy Ranch. I, I, th I think I did at Bundy Ranch. Actually, you know what, I gotta, I gotta think about that one. I know that I did over at uh, Occupy L.A., because I did not want to get wrapped up in the middle of something in case all hell broke loose. All it takes is one idiot to do something stupid, let off a fight, you know, light, light off a firecracker or something, and then all of a sudden, you could be in the middle of some chaos. So that's the type of stuff you want to avoid. You don't want to get thrown in jail. <laughs> Actually, that's kind of exactly. Sorry, not to laugh, Ford, but that's kind of exactly what happened to you. So um, let's let's get Ford into the program here. And let's just kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what we learned from Mr. Pete Santilli through Ford Fisher. Hello. And Ford, we are live on Agree to Disagree. How are you doing today, sir? Doing quite well. How are you today, Brian? Well, other than uh, some uh, some glitches, glitches get stitches apparently. Um, no, uh, I'm doing swell. I'm I'm doing great. I was kind of in my intro, uh, recalling going out to uh, Bundy Ranch, and then I mentioned, uh, you know, questions of blurring the lines between journalism and activist, and I definitely mentioned the fact that you were thrown into the back of a wagon despite clear press credentials. Uh, press, press credentials in Baltimore during those riots. So, man, we got so many different places to go with this story. I don't know where you want to start, but I think <laughs> I think somewhere along the lines of like, let's set this up from the beginning for the listener that doesn't right. know what's going on. Of course, we're here um, to to kind of you released an exclusive on news to share uh, your your conversation, your interview, if you will, through prison um, on on written telegram on on written paper. Uh, with Pete Santilli, who has been arrested, but uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But can you help us set this up again? Uh, going back to Bundy Ranch, what's going on? What is this all about? Why did they go up to Oregon? Why Pete Santilli? Dot dot dot. And then we'll kind of get into your Baltimore experience, and then let's get into the meat of the the letter itself. Sure. Um, so Santilli's an interesting character. Uh, to understand him, it may actually make sense to go a little bit earlier than the first Bundy standoff, which was in 2014. Uh, Santilli is, uh, I believe, co-owns or has co-founded, but he's, he's the major player in a network called Talk Network News. So he's basically uh, your, your uh, right-wing radio host kind of guy. He's definitely um, uh, not a gentle journalist when it comes to his opinions, and in 2013, he kind of caught the attention of uh, the national media and the FBI when on uh, talk network news, he said that he would like to shoot Hillary Clinton in the vagina. Um, That's you can right. Look, at, look That's up that right. quote. That was a rather provocative thing that he had said. It, it was in reference to um, the Benghazi incident, which he felt that she had done wrong and that he his feeling was that that's what she should be sentenced to like in a court of law but he said something to the effect of and if they don't do it i will and the fbi knocked on the door ah, um okay. yeah <laughs> so this has been this is somebody who um uh has been kind of at odds with uh federal law enforcement since before any of these situations so it makes sense that he would uh 
that he would feel the need to show up at a situation where you have an armed uh, uh, standoff of some kind with federal agents. And it also makes sense that in so doing, he wouldn't necessarily be the quietest uh, player in in those interactions. Well, now I showed um, up. I showed up, and I never advocated shooting anybody in the vagina yet. I went to Bundy Ranch, I, and, and I, I assume you advocated not shooting anybody in any other places. Well, you, I, I added I, I added the caveat of yet. I, I have not put that out there yet. Now in the future, who knows? Who knows? No, that's right. Because uh, we we actually we we went up there and we spoke with Pete. One of the first interviews we got was, "Hey, you're the guy that shot this video. How did you get here? How did you know this was a story? Why were you here?" It, it's almost like why would if if you see those viral videos on Facebook or something, and it's a you know something hilarious or something horrible, and you. Why would somebody have been filming that totally innocuous moment? How would someone have known sure. to, to turn a camera? This is staged. This is fake. Um, you know, and that was one of the questions I asked. Him. I just said, "How did you know to be here? How did you know that this was going to be a thing? Because that thing went viral oh, north of I don't know, north of a million views, 1.3 or something, um, in about a week. Everybody saw it, and that's why people showed up out there." That was kind of the difference maker between Bundy Ranch and uh, the Oregon standoff was the public saw this video, they were horrified, and went out there and said, hang on a second here, we all need to calm down, this is some crap, you got, this, this <laughs> should not be going on, so, anyway, I digress, like I said, there's a lot of different angles to cover here, but you were saying Pete Santilli got a knock on the door from the FBI, because he advocated shooting Hillary Clinton in the vagina, yes, <laughs> okay, so let's pick it up right. from there. Um, so I was basically just setting that up mostly so people can kind of imagine what kind of a uh, character he is. And I, and I should note, by the way, I've never spoken to the man out loud, right? I've now spoken to, in the last you know few days, I've spoken to several people who have uh, met him in person, including yourself. Uh, but my only person, like Ford Fisher to San Tilly contact has been via uh, a letter, right? But... Um, Right, so we go to so in 2014 he's there at the at the Bundy uh, standoff. Which, hang on, hang which on. You're now, probably for, for, more familiar with than I am. Yeah, I, I, a, <laughs> a, a little bit, but there's so many nuances between what's going on with the BLM and what the Constitution says about land that the federal government can own. It's a very complicated case. <laughs> um, I went there and I was even more confused after having talked to everybody. But I just I wanted to get them a chance to say it in case the whole place was burned down like Ruby Ridge style. But I was going to say. Um, we could even go back further than Bundy Ranch with Pete Santilli because there was something going on with – there was a, a rally for the truckers. There, there was a – do you remember – do you know the event that I'm talking about? If not, I'm going to have to pull yeah, it up there. And... So, I, so because of the Santilli stuff, I've seen uh, this actually come up. But, but to be honest, I'm not well informed enough of, uh, to, to try to summarize. But I invite you to do so. Uh, well, okay. Let's Let's just say before Bundy Ranch, there was a – some event for truckers to organize and raise money and do something. I think it had something to do with the tea part. Now, I'd have to look it up. And, and look, I'm not even going to pass any judgments because I don't even know. I, I know some people that were very upset with uh, Pete Santilli's involvement in the trucker uh, rally. Um, there are a lot of accusations made and things that I'm not going to necessarily repeat and I'm not going to take a side either way. But there were quite a few people with ruffled feathers over Pete's involvement in the trucker rally. So the, the, to add a slim degree of specificity to that, I've, I've personally heard allegations from people that, that in some way he financially uh, stole from them. And, and these these are accusations, and I haven't seen anything proven or right. any court I have, cases. I have no or, way to vet it, I, you know, anything like that. I just know that he left a poor taste in yeah, the Yeah, the, the rumors and the rumblings are out there, you know, and that that's not necessarily to paint a... Like I said, you know, I, I did meet Pete. I had, I had an extensive interview with him. It's on our website, The New American Media, or check the YouTube channel, um, youtube.com slash The New American Media. I, I like the guy. He was, he was a funny, engaging, interesting dude. Um, but that doesn't mean... You know, I I can have good conversations with people that do not so good things from time to time. That doesn't mean anything. So, you know, I, I enjoyed my time with him. But anyhow, so I just wanted to add that little caveat for people. If you want to go look, do some additional research into finding out who this guy is and what's going on, I I encourage you. The internet is uh, what do they say in the age of information? Ignorance is a choice. So go ahead, look around, do some Google searches, and find out some more info on your own. I don't want to dwell on that because I kind of want to get to the meat of this story. So, now we're back to 2014. Pete Santilli goes out there after the Hillary thing and after the trucker yeah. thing. Let's pick it up from there. 
Um, well, the, I mean, the interesting thing about the Nevada standoff is that it ended, <laughs> is that it ended peacefully. So despite him probably being seen as, as fueling the flames of it, and this is, the, this is sort of the question around him that's almost philosophical, it's almost larger than he or his network is, which is um, the role of a, you know, member of the press and whether his objectivity is is compromised Ob obviously he wouldn't claim to have a, a model like like my own website like news to share where we do not take any stance right uh, he he does take stances on things i mean he is a classic you know right wing radio host he is the kind of guy who will um totally pass judgment on whatever he's talking about but there's a difference between commentary uh commentary and opinion and then actual advocacy so when so in nevada my understanding is that he was present but that he was calling for more people to come, right? So he was essentially asking for greater material support. He was telling people, we need we need every... He, I, saw, I actually read in the FBI uh, complaint against him, which, which was filed now for the 2014 thing, that he was advocating for anybody who can legally own a gun, you know, get over here. And he was more or less saying, like, if the situation arises where you can legally shoot them, then do it. Um... And so he was treading a very fine line there. And at least in the eyes of the law, it seems like he was in the clear about that and sort of got away with it in the same way that Clive and Bundy did. But fast forward to 2016, and now uh, upon him being arrested for the, for the 2016 standoff, which we'll get to, uh, they're also backcharging him for the 2014 stuff, which by any reasonable person's standards... They probably wouldn't have done it if it weren't for this new thing. Basically, they you know they grabbed them all for the for the 2016 stuff, and then all of the ones who were present at the 2014 standoff are also being charged for that. And it's in and it's especially interesting because that includes Clive and Bundy, who was not present at the 2016 one, and literally they arrested him like when he got to the airport <laughs> to to go to Oregon. So he had, so he did nothing related to Oregon. They they grabbed him, and then they grab all of the people who were at both places. Um, I, it's totally, well, you know, while they, while the FBI doesn't have to explain what motivated them to do it now, it's very obvious, uh, that they're making the arrests, uh, sort of in a timely fashion based on, on this. It's not like it took exactly two years to prepare the case against Peter Santilli and, uh, for the 2014 stuff. And they just said, all right, we're ready. Oh, look at that. He's in jail for a different standoff. That's convenient. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very timed, I would, I would even say, uh, sort of political move to uh, indict uh, Peter Santilli, Clive and Bundy. I believe there are two more who are also present uh, for the 2014 case. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, you know, if, if, I, if I were running some sort of in, in investigation, some sort of... Uh, police uh, department or FBI wing or division that was handed this case. I mean, I can't say I would I would have done it very or all that much differently. Now, now I'm not talking about the, um, the 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 choke point and the ambush that that subsequently led to Lavoy Finnegan uh, leaving in his car and trying to avoid it, and then going up into a snowbank and having some idiot cop jump out in front of him, and then have him come out with his hands up, only to bring his hands down, possibly toward his waistband. Only question being, was he reaching for a gun, or had he already been shot at that point? We don't know because we still don't have audio. Like I said, it's it's a slightly complicated case, but aside from that that uh, that killing, I don't know that I would have done it all that much differently. I mean, they did kind of wait this thing out for a long time. Um, there, mm -hmm. there was no violence. No, nobody. You know that they didn't attack anybody, and then of course they're saying that they were threats, and it's like, well, no, I was just shaking the end of my my rattlesnake tail, telling you, be careful. Be careful if you're going to come in here. I don't want you to bother me. Um, so many angles on this thing. Um, so, I, uh, re regarding that, I sort of want to do a little bit of a history thing on, on tactics and situations like this, because there, there's a really interesting angle on this, which virtually no one's talked about, and it sort of makes sense that they haven't. Um, that angle is, uh, up until 1999, whenever you had some kind of an armed situation like this, the... Uh, procedure among police, right, who who have to deal with some kind of like a really drastic situation, would always be to 
form a perimeter, right? Get Make a big circle out of it, nobody leaves, and then they'd take hours before they'd enter, sort of, if ever. Um, that changed in 1999 when Columbine happened, right? Mm. And then we started to see various shooting situations, you know, kids shooting up their high school, whatever, and, and specifically the Columbine one, where the difference of tactic is in whether or not the person wants to actually survive. The, the failure of, of law enforcement in Columbine, they didn't go in until the kids had already killed themselves. And the reason was they assumed that those kids wanted to get out alive um, and that they were taking hostages. In fact, they were just killing people and, you know, it was whatever. So there was, so then, then it evolved into, okay, during crazy situations like this, because now the 21st century is filled with crazy people, just get in kind of as fast as you can. Make the perimeter, but get in. Um, now we're returning to, and we really only have a few examples, these, these long drawn out situations that do not have hostages. And this is what's fascinating to figure out what they should do with it. There is zero urgency for the FBI to raid a, a situation where people are armed but do not have hostages. Eventually they will literally just run out of food and have to leave. Um, I, I would bet that the FBI would be willing to hang out for a really, really, really long time because it would end in, theoretically, the least bloodshed. And then these these other tactics, the, the, the fact that they were able to make those arrests when they got people out, um, is basically the result of, you know, dare I say, ignorance on the part of... Um, Finnecum and and Fundy that that they drove a hundred miles away from their standoff and then they were arrested there. R- rule number one of a standoff: don't leave the standoff. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's, that's you know, I, I, it's bringing up like Fight Club quotes for me. Uh, the, the first right. rule of Fight Club: do not. And what's the other one? Uh, untouchables. No, never bring a knife to a gunfight. Um, no, it's I mean, true. I mean, it's people. True. So they're they're trying to hold out this place. They have no hostage. There's virtually no leverage if you leave the the occupied territory. So they, they the FBI made them feel comfortable enough to drive a hundred miles away, which, which is where the FBI can have them totally surrounded. And it's only like seven dudes, you know, between two cars. Uh, you know, in essence, it it made sense that it that it happened that way, and that the FBI was extremely patient. What, what you could rest assured of, though, is that it would have been much different if an unaffiliated person was, was trapped there. And it's totally not in the nature of these guys to hold a hostage, but if, but if they were, uh, then you can bet the, the tactics would be completely different. Yeah, see, that's different with Columbine because there's so many innocent people there. Um, you, you look at Ferguson, you look at Baltimore. I mean, these are people torching and destroying completely innocent people's, you know, their their livelihoods, their 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 shops and their their, their property, and, and you know, the, the, these guys weren't burning the building down. They just went there and said, "We're not leaving." Well, all right, right. Then, well, so then we'll turn the water right. so off. We'll turn the Wi-Fi off. They're doing is, yeah. yeah. You just wait until they do leave. <laughs> yeah, Basically. that's that's kind of what I thought was going to happen. And then you heard some local officials started getting really antsy, getting real frustrated, and 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 really starting to speak out in an aggressive tone, saying we've had about enough of this. And you could tell, you could tell that they were getting ready to make a move. That pressure was coming down. I don't know if it was Loretta uh, Lynch. I don't know if it was Barack Obama. I don't know if it was you know the governor or one of the senators. Who who knows? But you could start to tell. Uh, th- that the pressure was was kicking in, and that they were being told, "You need to go end this now. You need to find a way to end this now." I don't know if you noticed that, but I definitely picked up mm. on that right before the the killing of Lavoy Finnicum. So it it was picking up before Lavoy. That is true. And then following Lavoy, if if you recall, and this was very interesting, the FBI set up checkpoints, and they were telling people, "You have a deadline to leave. Right? That you can leave." And you have to check in with them. It's not like you just scoot on out and wearing a mask and they never find you again, <laughs> right? They convince people, oh, you'll you can leave. You'll I, we promise we won't arrest you, right? So they they arrested only three of them on the way out, and I believe eight more of eight of them were allowed to go after the Finicum shooting. Eight people willingly checked in with the FBI, but then were able to leave without being arrested and the reason that they did that is the FBI is trying to say okay guys you, like you can go we're not going to do anything about it because they don't want to corner 
uh, uh, you know, a, a person with a gun. And so in doing that, they ended up with only four people left. Um, and, and then that, that led to the, the insane drama that we heard on, um, on the phone on Gavin Symes' phone call where he was broadcasting live like the 24 hours before the standoff did end with, with you got four people clinging to their guns uh, saying, we're not leaving, we're not leaving, as the FBI is 50 feet away from them. Oh, they um, were screaming. It was back and forth. I remember, uh, I think I, I, I stumbled across that. I think it was embedded on a cop block page. And, um, you know, I, I think cop block does a couple of good things. And I think they do a lot of irresponsible stuff. But, um, you know, whatever. It's uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other. You don't have to love everybody's uh, entire. Hey, I like a lot of bands, but it doesn't mean I love all their albums. It's okay. Um, but anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I stumbled across that on, on Twitter and I was just, I was wrapped up in it because. It was every second could have been when the doors, when the flashbang grenade came in. Remember uh, Christopher Dorner, that former LAPD, mm-hmm. and he got he ended up uh, he killed a couple people, and he ended up hold out in um, up in a cabin somewhere in the mountains, and they burned the place down, just killed him inside. You know, and it's like you never know how these crazy things are going to end. So it's like you're just kind of riveted to the radio, going, "What the heck's going to happen next? What is going to happen next?" You know, not necessarily uh, fingers crossed, hoping for bloodshed or anything. Probably even the opposite. But it was riveting. Yes, it was very bizarre. It was very riveting. It was very tense. You could tell that. Um, similar to how I felt at Bundy Ranch when they're pointing at the mountains and, and showing you where the snipers are at, where the helicopters are coming over. I mean, you could just you could cut the tension in, in the air with a with a you know. A, a fake knife or whatever um it, it's so palpable but yeah so anyway it leads up to to the last four people are stuck there in the oregon refuge after that right um so and basically you had there was one of them there was one one woman who i thought was going to be the the final standout there was the um god now now their names are escaping me but, but basically it was a couple it was a husband and wife plus one other uh man and uh, and then David Fry, right? And we'll get to him in a second. But um, the the woman was basically saying, "I don't want to go to jail. I can't go to jail. I can't like I just can't do it." And eventually, right? It took like you know a really long time, but they eventually talk her into going. And you saw how little leverage they had against the FBI. They were trying to negotiate for just the littlest stuff. They were asking, "Can you send you know a?" a pastor out to walk us to the FBI when we, when we surrender and the FBI was like no <laughs> and and it makes sense because that could just be delivering them a hostage but yeah um, yeah and and, and, know, and, and so, on the flip side they were concerned that they were going to get executed you know it, right it, uh, right so they, there were at least at, at least um, overtly they their their claim was that they're not turning themselves in because they're afraid that they just be be killed and and it's interesting actually because I think there was some degree of naivety in terms of of how they felt like it was going to end anyway. So they they actually I remember a very specific moment stuck out to me, which was that they were they were told go put uh, put the key you know put the keys on top of the dashboard in your car and leave your guns in there and then come out with your hands up unarmed. And the woman <laughs> said something like. The FBI is telling us to put our guns there, and um, when this is all over, they'll give us our guns back. <laughs> nah, um, yeah, sure they will. Yeah. And we'll sell you some swamp yeah. land down in Florida and in the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> right. Like, so, I mean, they'll give us our guns back. I mean, it, it, it's actually it's a fascinating thing coming from the kind of person who says they're coming to take our guns you know, about 20 times a day, right, for them to say, I think the FBI is going to give us our guns back when this is all over. Not That's not going to happen. Such an, um, odd, such an odd story. Everybody was saying, I don't get the tactics. I don't get the motive. I don't get the, the what, are, what is the objective here? What are they trying to accomplish? I was listening to that um, I, driving around, and it, and it continued from the night before, and it continued the next day. And, right. and, and, it, and it was, I don't want to pay taxes to fund abortions, and th- we need to stop that. It's like, what, what, you expect them to, to, to completely change the tax code and the, and the tax law? And like, <laughs> like, let's get Scalia yeah, they, on, on they Roe like versus Wade. A, they should have applied for nonprofit status from, yeah. from right in there. And you know, done some it, was, it was bizarre. There was no real, 
I, I didn't. I never really understood the purpose. I get, you know, standing up and saying, "Hey, what happened to the Hammonds here? This is not right. This is not okay." You know, and, and we have a right to protest. We don't have a right to go seize property. We don't have a right to make threats. We don't have a right to do any of that crap. We have a right to peaceably assemble. And you peaceably assemble by not blocking traffic like Black Lives Matter did on the 405 the other day. And I drove past it and honked and <clears throat> yelled a few cuss words at them because I can't stand those types of protesters that, that, that disrupt other people. You don't have the right to do that to other people. And, you know, unfortunately, that's what they were doing here. Yeah, this David Fry, it says here, um, after repeatedly threatening to shoot himself, complaining that he couldn't get marijuana, and ranting about UFOs, drone strikes in Pakistan, leaking nuclear plants, and the government chemically mutating people, the last occupier, David Fry, 27, lit a cigarette, shouted hallelujah, and walked out of his barricaded encampment into FBI custody. Now, if that's not a weird conclusion to a <laughs> weird story... I, I'm looking forward to, to the film of this. Um... Yeah, so look, they, the other three who, who were there, I think, so they, they weren't staying there for intellectual reasons. They were, they, were, they were holding out because they stayed past the deadline and then realized that oh, they'd crap. be arrested and got scared about jail. And then they were saying all kinds of stuff on the phone, essentially to postpone their arrest. And remember that, that two out of those three, two of them were, were a couple. They're married to each other. It's a husband and wife. And presumably they'd be separated in in jail, and you know they're going to spend some kind of a lengthy sentence or whatever. Literally, I mean they're 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 just drawing for straws to spend time together. <laughs> uh, mm. is, is part of my analysis. Of one, it. So one, one last think romp, just, you think? One last romp? Yeah, basically. And and actually, if you go on News to Share, and this was from a while ago, they they actually they had posted a video, or, or I should say, David posted a video of that couple and they they had it was titled maybe last dance and it yeah, was them I did see that dancing if you could even call it that i mean it wasn't it wasn't really great dancing but it was basically them just hugging and kind of stepping and spinning um it was and, kind of saying goodbye was it was kind of saying goodbye right. And the only question was, and, you know, are, were they going to take each other's lives in a murder-suicide? Were they going to come out guns blazing yeah, yeah. with a suicide by cop? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it was that tense, and he was saying, so, you know, some, some things about suicide. Yeah, I mean, it, it got real intense there at the end. It absolutely did. Right, so, so, those, but, so those three eventually realized that it was in their sort of rational, selfish interest to go. David Fry, I, th I think there's one of two options. One... He, he actually is mentally ill, which I think is is very possible listening listening to him. Or or two, he was trying to ham up his mental illness intentionally to cite, oh. you know, basically to have it be a mitigating factor in a in a trial. Remember, oh. so, so to people who can't picture him, this is these guys. All the rest of the, the Oregon protesters are are manly men, with the exception of the woman. <laughs> you know, are manly men. Uh, ranchers and things like that. David Fry is like a nerdy 21-year-old uh, uh, kid with like long hair um, that I think is dyed black um, who, who believes in, in UFOs and and all all this various stuff. And, hey, and I, b I believe really in you. influenced I, I, by I the, the darkest areas of the internet that would have you believe that like the FBI is reptilian aliens and that kind of stuff. And this is all stuff that like that kid was saying in his final hours there. So I think he was either trying to make himself, himself sound insane for the benefit of a trial later, or he just genuinely is insane. Hey, I'll tell you what, I, 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 would, fi I would find I find it uh, difficult to believe that anybody could absorb a few seasons of Ancient Aliens and look at, <laughs> you, you, no, no, and do, do the research and not consider the possibility that UFOs that that there, you know what? I think that the universe could be teeming with life. I think it was possible that the beings from the heavens that descended from the skies, that we are a some sort of progeny. I don't know if it was a science fair project or just offspring or something else. Man, I am a firm believer in the possibility of all of that stuff. I I, I actually think the people that rule that stuff out are crazy, but that's me. Are are, did you actually cite like ancient aliens though on this like like really like on History Channel? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and and you know there, there are episodes and there are moments that I can break apart and go ah come on this is garbage, but 
a lot of these <laughs> other things the through thing. independent through oh, independent research. Yes, I I am a, a, a totally in that camp. I've been studying this. It, it's it's one of the more fascinating things. I actually get annoyed with myself sometimes that I spend so much time on politics, current events, and sports. When you know the most important question that we should be asking is who are we? How did we get here? What happens when we pass from this plane of existence? Those are the real good questions. I, I would love to focus maybe, you know what? Thank you, Ford Fisher. I think in 2016, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the esoteric and the metaphysical and uh, the grand scheme ideas. I got to get some more of those guests this year. Thank you for helping me well, remember that. <laughs> well, while I, I actually, while I very much encourage your intellectual uh, uh, evolution or whatever on that particular subject, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say David Fry uh, was not on to something when he was saying that the FBI trying to arrest him from 50 feet away may have been influenced by aliens. I, I'm going to go on a limb and say uh, the History Channel does not uh, adequately provide evidence that that could be true. So I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say David Fry was either insane or pretending to be insane. Yeah, that, that's he a, was right about the aliens. That, <laughs> that, is, that is an interesting thing, though, that, that either he is uh, mentally ill or he was hamming it up to help him out later on. Okay, so agreed on that point. That's that's interesting. I hadn't. It was obvious, but I hadn't really uh, said that out loud or heard that said out loud, and that makes a lot of sense now. So, um, so, so then basically what we have is one person dead, Lavoy Finnicum, uh, Clive and Bundy arrested. Why the hell did he fly up there? I just I, I don't get this whole clan. I don't get their. their I don't get what everybody's doing. It, it, I, I just don't understand the rationale and, and the... It, it's like I'm watching them play chess, and it's they're, they're playing it in a way that I'm very unfamiliar with. Um, but basically, Lavoy Finnicum is dead. The, the, wild, the wildlife refuge that was seized. Why ever they seized a wildlife refuge? Um, that's empty. David Fry and all these people are in jail and wrapped up in all of this. A couple of Bundys in there. Make it three if you if you count Cliven, and you can. Yeah, three um, now. <laughs> yeah, three. And they're all in the same jail together, by the way. I, I to my I don't know whether or not they've been able to speak to each other. I know many jails se uh, segregate co-defendants so that they can't talk to each other. Oh, so it's they very can't plausible get their stories. It's very together. plausible that they can't talk to each other, but I do not know that for a fact. But okay. I, I would say it's a safe assumption that that Cliven, Ammon, and Ryan are not able to just hang out with each other in the mess hall. Or, or, if, or if they were in an Orange County jail, they could just break out pretty easily. That's another story out here in my neck of the woods. Or if they were in a Mexican jail, they could sneak out through a uh, tunnel or, or occupy the tunnel. El Bundy. El Bundy. Or, or honestly, if you, you've got like 20 of those guys in the same uh, jail there, maybe they'll occupy the jail. <laughs> It'll turn into the jail standoff. Occupy jail. Occupy Malur. Uh, no, I guess El Chapo and El Bundy. El Bu I keep saying El Bundy, and I just keep thinking, if I won't score three touchdowns in a high school football game or something like that. No, El Bundy, like El Chapo. Anyway, okay, so, so they're in jail. That's what's going on. And in the middle of all this, there's a unique, interesting, added component here, which is a journalist slash talk show host. We're kind of telling this story uh, Pulp Fiction style, you know, totally out of sequence. But welcome to agree to disagree at the New American Media. That's my style. It's how I roll. Deal with it. Um, but that's what what's happened is is a journalist has been wrapped up in the middle of this. And I want to get to the letter. Um, before I get to the letter, do you have any updates on your situation in Baltimore? I know last time we spoke, yeah. something had occurred, and you weren't at liberty to fully explain. But uh, you da, da, da. any updates from that? But as of the last time I spoke to my lawyer that something was supposed to happen in February <laughs> right so he, he hasn't replied to me since uh, January 17th or so okay. and uh, January so, 17th you know, at 4.52pm like coded language if, if a lawsuit is happening then such lawsuits should theoretically be filed sometime in the month of February so, so theoretically there should be progress in the next two weeks and, uh, and, and some, and some, as I said the last time I was on your show, yeah. the the whole experience has very much highlighted for me the slowness of of the legal process, and that's it's not terrible. just government bureaucracy, although that's a big part of it, but lawyers, courts, just every aspect of dealing with either civil or criminal charges of any kind. The whole thing is so 
slow. Glacial. Uh, which also highlights the, the, the immenseness of what it means to be held without bonds, such as uh, Pete Santilli. Now, you and I, we, we met through uh, Solutions Institute, uh, an, right. an, an activist consulting firm. Um, and, and one of the key components of uh, the person who started that, Dan Johnson, he started something, Panda, People Against the NDAA. The NDAA, what is that, Section 1021, 1022, if, if I recall correctly, it kind of states that uh, uh, people's United States citizens can be held without charge, without trial, indefinitely for the duration of a conflict. And when you're at a war, in a war versus terrorism, which like is a th- thing it's a concept and you can't really defeat a concept so it's perpetual orwellian war um theoretically people can be disappeared into jail and it, it's it's one of these things that kind of unites a lot of people in the liberty movement going oh whoa 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 you guys got to erase this thing in a heartbeat this is way too ambiguous and dangerous to just leave sitting around like that it's like you don't leave a loaded firearm with your kid playing around you don't leave this thing tucked into any sort of code or statute or, you know, this seemingly innocuous uh, defense spending bill that's kind of rubber stamped every year. But, you know, th- th- that's one of the concerns is that people could just be grabbed indefinitely, you know, thrown down to Guantanamo, right. uh, be- outsourced through rendition to some North African country or something crazy like that. We think that can't happen, but then all the allegations with Home and Square over in Chicago. Uh, where people are just disappeared and tortured and this and that. Really? In America? In Chicago? Well, Rahm Emanuel, folks. Never waste, let an opportunity... What is it? Never let a crisis go to waste. Um, but yeah, it, it, it just highlights the dangers of when journalists can get wrapped up in something like this. Uh, t- give people the, the just the bullet points, just the, just the cliff notes of what happened to you in Baltimore if they missed the last episode we talked about this. Right. I, before I do that, I do want to clarify that that Santilli is is charged with several different crimes. Correct. Whether or not correct. You correct. Consider those crimes legitimate is, is a different question. Yeah, I didn't. But, I didn't mean to set it up like not, he just this disappeared. This is not specifically an NDAA uh, related case. It's not like they're citing NDAA to. to him detained. No, I just want to clarify. No, no, that, that, that that's very true. Thank you for saying that. That's that wasn't my intention of it. I, I was just kind of uh, grabbing three pieces from the ether and uh, kind of c- conflating them all together because <laughs> sure. they're all kind of tangentially related. And there's implications where if you don't stand up for people's right to, you know, go cover the news, they can be grabbed. And th- because the the uh, the court system takes so long anyway, it moves at a glacial pace. Um, technically, if people wanted to. They could just be thrown into the, you know, under the guise of NDAA that this person's a national security risk for X, Y, Z reason, um, and sit there even longer. What is longer than, you know, as long as it takes to go through a court case? Indefinitely. That's longer. So, yes, I, I was not trying to say that. Thank you for clarifying. So, now, sure. your situation, you went for, for, for news to share. You did not go uh, to F- Ferguson, correct? You did go to Baltimore. Do I have that right? I wasn't in Ferguson, but my co-founder, Trey Yanks, has been to Ferguson uh, several times, including to deal with legal issues because he was also arrested in Ferguson. And so his his conclusion was they uh, expunged the arrest record and uh, paid out a settlement of $8,500. So uh, he's in the clear, and uh, News to Share is still in the process, actually, of uh, doing the uh, accounts. There's actually there's still outstanding legal stuff. He actually still has to reappear in St. Louis for one thing. But once the, um, but the but the case is settled, and then once it's completely dealt with, and he essentially has a piece of paper that says you're completely uh, um, have a record expunged. We're going to be taking all of the proceeds from that settlement and turning it into a news to share scholarship for uh, students in. Missouri looking to enter journalism. And granted, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of money left after lawyers' fees, travel, all of that kind of stuff, but it's more um, it's more about the concept, which is that uh, we, this is you know this is not something to be profited on, but rather something that we can use to advocate the the free press. Well, anyway, yeah. so that was him in Ferguson. Well, but you know that, um, that, that that's another danger though. That's another danger where you know, you think of what? What are we? Seventeen trillion dollars in debt, one hundred and eighty trillion in unfunded liabilities in debt. You reach a point where it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's binary code. It's ones and zeros. It's just digits on a computer screen. You hit enter and you create more money. You create more debt. It's so absurd. It's ridiculous. Um, just 
you know, grabbing journalists to shut down news stories and then kick them ten grand later uh, to sh- to shut down a story to push an agenda to keep the light uh, from shining at the you know onto the cockroaches. That you know that is that is dangerous precedent where it's like, yeah, we'll have to pay a slap on the wrist, but we'd rather do that than let this story get out. You know, you think of those people that uh, the guy that filmed Walter Scott's shooting down in Carolina what was that South Carolina? Um, right, man, the guy that did that, I. I sh- sh- I would be petrified of of getting taken out by those cops at that point. Like I, I'm sitting there holding the thing in my fa- my hand that could send you to jail for life. Could you make it look like I had an accident or got violent with you? You know, it's it's a dangerous thing. Anyway, I digress. Let's get back on track. So he went over to Ferguson, got arrested, had a lawsuit. You went to Baltimore, and right. And so in my case, uh, there were the riots basically from. Um, April 25th to May 2nd. I I was present there starting April 24th, where there was a completely peaceful protest that happened the first day that I went. Uh, The second day, there was a very large uh, formal organized protest, probably 3,000 people, uh, enormous march, stayed completely peaceful, but then once the official event ended, it it turned into a much rowdier protest. Um, and then following that, you know, that evening, basically, it descended into into complete, you know, violence and chaos, uh, which is more or less how it stayed continuing for the remainder of, of the week. When it got to May 2nd, um, everybody was celebrating because the Baltimore 6, the, the police officers responsible for the death of uh, Freddie Gray, um, were... Uh, Charged and it happened very swiftly, and, and many would say that it was a result of the activism. Uh, some people would say that's a success of the democratic process. People advocated for something and then it happened. Some people would say uh, you shouldn't base your decision on whether to indict somebody or the swiftness of indicting someone based on activists. You should do it based on the blind color of the law. Uh, not, my, not my place to, to pass judgment on that. Everybody's celebrating on May 2nd because they got what they want. But the curfew is still in place. So uh, they're celebrating, they're dancing, they're, you know, I had footage, I, I actually I posted a photo to Facebook that day of a dude wearing like a, a, a bulletproof vest and carrying a gas mask who had a, who had a, um, a skull face mask on and like a spiked helmet and he's talking and smiling with a cop, right? Everybody's happy. Cops are talking to, the, to people, they're laughing, everything's good. 10 p.m., boom, curfew starts, and they start getting mad because it's the curfew. And so they send in National Guard, all the police get heavily armed, and the protesters get mad because they were peaceful and the police, uh, you know, showed up there. Um, Getting into detail, but you can watch all of this stuff kind of on video online, um, including my own video. Tell tell them where your website is. Tell them where your website is. Right, right. So my website is news to share news the number dot com. If you just Google Ford Fisher um, Baltimore, you you'll find it. It was reported on by a, a, a lot of different sites, sort of in our network. So it includes, yeah, you, there was a you, an article on uh, <laughs> Solutions Institute, Mint Press News, uh, photography is not a crime, uh, cop block. Uh, you know, a, a number of others. But, yeah, you so kind of pulled a Santilli, or Santilli pulled a Fisher. You became part of the news at the at the protest. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I, I very much hesitate <laughs> to compare myself to to him. But the, and and the reason I say that is because I I truly was there to objectively report it. You can look at all of our coverage from the week from from the whole week leading up to that you can look at all of our coverage of Ferguson we we just record what happens right if the cops are doing something they shouldn't be we get it if the protesters are doing something they shouldn't be we get it and so what what happened in this case was I was following there was there was a specific group of cops who was um pushing protesters particularly um I would say inappropriately they were they were pepper spraying uh protesters from behind to make them leave faster in the name of uh, curfew compliance there was a cop who had his baton out who I had seen throughout the week and who would ultimately be the one to slam me on the ground and cuff me um, who, so basically I was following these guys because there was a particularly uh, aggressive set of cops and I sort of turned out to be right um, 
what's interesting is that uh, basically when all of this stuff happened, all of the press, everybody was started at one intersection. When it went crazy, they tried to put all the press into like one little pen. And it's funny because Trey, the co-founder, describes that he was in the pen and he's looking around and he's like, uh-oh, Fort's not here. And then it's six minutes later that I'm walking up with the cops cuffed and I'm like, what the hell is going on? What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Um, no, and don't so, don't forget at Bundy Ranch they they had an area far away from where where everybody was gathering, and it said this is your First Amendment area, your First Amendment zone. I forget exactly how they had it phrased. I, I got to look at the picture, but yeah, they they, right. they say here's your freedom of speech area. No, that's not an area. It's a thing. Just like we're at war against terrorism. No, that's not possible. That's a tactic, not a thing that can be defeated, you morons. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the the concept of, all right, press, you all get over here and uh, you can tell your stupid little stories to each other and your stupid little blogs. Here, you, ju you just sit in this <laughs> pen. Go, You go sit down in the basement and we've left some crayons out. Have some fun. It's like, no, you don't get it. <laughs> That's right. not what you're allowed to do to the press. It's a free and open press as long as the press is not impeding an investigation. They're not throwing Molotov cocktails. They're not inciting riots like Mike Brown's parents. You know, like, if the press are there just reporting on things, th that is supposed to be uh, just the absolute untouchable thing that nobody can mess with. You're the press. You're there to record and report. You're not getting in the way, but you are there and you're not going away. Um, that's mm -hmm. so crucial. And I think that, that's where Pete Santilli, a lot of the uh, comments that I've been seeing, and, and you know, I, I definitely did watch some of the, the live streams, and um, it, it, was, it was very... Um, well, here, you know what, Be best way to sum that up, I got a tweet, um, oh, what is this one here, um, one of them says, if, if it's about more cameras, then why did he call for guns, regarding Pete Santilli, one says, um, is he remorseful about verbally assaulting a protester, hang on, let me find the one, uh, where did that one go, uh, calling for guns, hang on, I, I got a bunch of tweets here, uh, oh, yeah, it says, uh, when your letter of admission with we just isn't enough, answer questions on Internet radio. You know, David Tyler said that kind of snarkily. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, but, but that's, that's a legitimate critique of Pete Santilli and what he was doing. It was, it was a we thing, and he was caught. He, he kind of, uh, I don't know if it was Stockholm Syndrome, or he went there to kind of become a part of it under a shield that he didn't really have the right to hold anymore. Uh, th there's a lot of critiques over uh, what is journalism versus what is protesting and, and joining a movement. And I think that's kind of at the core of this question here uh, in a similar way to like what Apple finds itself in, you know, trying to, uh, trying to def you, yeah. you know, you, you have to now, a judge is trying to compel them to make their products all hackable and they're, they're trying to say no. And it, it's a complicated thing, uh, you know, where do you blur the lines between uh, complying with with federal law and uh, protecting the product that you've built. So anyway, ba back to this with Pete Santilli. It, th mm -hmm. th there are questions of did he become a participant and did that take away his First Amendment rights to be there with the press and therefore should he be lumped in with all of these people? I think that's kind of at the core of the question now regarding Pete Santilli. Right. Do you think I'm, I'm close on as, that one? As a as an objective uh, you know, journalist myself, my, my intention on coming here is not necessarily to advocate uh, either of those positions, because it's something that I've sort of, I've personally sort of grappled with, with reading his story, seeing evidence back and forth, um, but really I kind of, the, the main thing I did was I wrote him a letter. I said, what do you, what do you think, Peter? <laughs> what, what are you? Are you press? Are you militia? You know, are, like, and to, we'll, we'll get in, into the beef of the letter a little bit better, but his answer was basically that he considers himself a member of the free press but that he also considers himself a member of uh, the militia. And one of the things that, that I had asked him, is because I had read the FBI complaint, I don't know if he's actually had a chance to see that himself, but in my letter I included to him, uh, the FBI partially relied on, on your affiliation, your being a member of the Oath Keepers, uh, as part of the criminal complaint, that if you're saying I'm an Oath Keeper, then you're not a journalist, and therefore you're a part of the accusation. 
his answer was was more or less, well, I don't know why you think I'm a member of the Oath Keepers. It's not that I'm a member of them. It's that I endorse them. They they rely on me. Um, well, you know what's interesting? Of an, yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you brought up Oath Keepers, so I, I uh, reached on the wall. Sure. I still have my Oath Keeper card when I met Jeff Ford, who was a graphic artist and assistant Oath Keeper of Orange County. He was an individual that I met at Occupy LA when that thing was going on. What was that 2011 or something like that? Now, because you said, you know, are you a journalist or a militia member? And it brought up Oath Keepers. I ran and grabbed this mm. just a second ago because it says in bold letters, what we are not, we are not a militia. <laughs> it's the very first thing on, the, on the, their official stuff it says we are not a militia and by the way right. for, for the record um, the, the, one of the definitions says a militia generally is an army or other fighting unit that's comprised of non-professional fighters citizens of a nation or subjects of a state or, or government who can be called upon to enter a combat situation as opposed to a professional force of regular full-time military personnel or historically members of the fighting nobility class unable to hold their own against property trained or properly trained and equipped professional forces it is common for militias to engage in guerrilla warfare or defense instead of being used in open attacks and offensive actions and there are several different definitions of the word militia but it's really just an able-bodied person who can be a first responder in case of a, a, an emergency you know, someone's getting mauled by a pit bull. Are you a militia member? Well, no, but there's a, a an urgent thing going on here, and I need to jump into action because I'm an able-bodied human being, and, and I can't allow this this horrible act to happen. Militia is not a dirty word, uh, but they're 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 trying to use it as a dirty word. And I just find the oath keeper thing hilarious because it says what we are not. We are not a militia. We are not advocating or promoting the overthrow of any government, whether local, state, or national. We are not advocating or promoting violence towards any organization, group, or person. We are not advocating or promoting the removal of any person from his or her elected office. We are not advocating or promoting that anyone in the judicial branch be removed or replaced. We are not advocating or promoting any particular form of government other than the Constitutional Republic, which the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution defined and instituted. We are not advocating or promoting the rewriting of the Constitution, nor are we asking for an amendment thereto. We are not advocating or promoting any act or acts of aggression against any organization or person for any reason, including, but not limited to, race, religion, national origin, political affiliation, gender, or sexual orientation. I mean, they, number one, we are not a militia. So I just I just wanted to be clear about that because I've had Stuart Rhodes on the program before. Um, I think they're a very important organization, and you know, in their their documents, very mm -hmm. first thing, we are not a militia. So sorry for the tangent. Well, it's again. interesting you say that. Uh, P Peter Santilli actually mentioned uh, uh, Stuart Rhodes specifically in his letter, um, saying he wrote, Peter, uh, "Stuart Rhodes has relied upon my endorsement of his organization. You have it backwards, or someone does." He writes. The Oath Keepers relies upon my good words. When I criticize them, Stuart R. panics. Um, so his basic premise is that he's not a member of them. They rely on him, which is an odd uh, sort of flopping of the unity, him and them. But, uh, you know, it seems like a potato-potato distinction uh, from where I or from, prob where from probably the average person Sits. And this is sort of an interesting thing that he does, which is that he does wiggle out of giving uh, a yes or no answer on whether he's uh, affiliated with them in some in some way. Um, similarly, you know, later he, I use the word the militia, and then he writes the militia. Please share this with everyone. We are all the militia. It's important for everyone to understand this. Read the Federalist Papers to understand what dot dot dot. dot. Um, Basically, his his working premise is that he's not the militia, but everybody, including him, is the militia, so he's sort of the militia. Um, I don't think that the average citizen would say, uh, yes, I'm a member of Oath Keepers, yes, I'm a militia member, you know, whatever. I, I think it's sort of his right to self-identify that way. But, but most people, or at least the law enforcement agencies dealing with this, uh, see that as, as discrediting, discrediting him as a... Uh, professional or, or objective journalist. Okay. So so let's um, is this the time that, that we kind of hit the, the full reset and say um, after following the case for a while, Lavoie's dead and, and they all get arrested. You sit down, pen to paper, and you write the correctional facility that's holding Pete Santilli. Want to go through the letter now? 
<laughs> sure. So um, I wrote actually a total of uh, seven letters. Oh, did you? Um, I didn't know that. This is the first time you and I are talking. We Ford and I we, we we text back and forth, and he's also uh, one of the editors. In full disclosure, he's one of the editors on the New American Media Facebook page. So he'll, he'll he's been sharing some content, for, especially uh, specifically from news to share on the New American Media to kind kind of help uh, in the um, accumulation of information. It's just we're bombarded with info, and it's almost like it's almost like you need somebody to be like, hey. Ford, can you be in charge of this Oregon thing? Just dig around, find stories, and just work on that. I'm right. going to work on this uh, Apple case. I'm going to work on this Apple and this uh, the, the, this San Bernardino thing where it's just like after 9-11. They say, hey, we need the Patriot Act or else you're a dirtbag. We need to like throw away all of our civil liberties or else you're a dirtbag. So we get the Patriot Act, and now they need to do that because there was a terrorist attack. Um, anyway, so it, it, but, but there's so many stories going on. Just wanted to get that out there. Full disclosure, yes, you've been covering that, but... I also want to say that, that a lot of this conversation is me finally having a chance to catch up with you because I had no idea you sent seven letters to him. That's interesting. Sure. Uh, so I can list off the names for you here. So basically, uh, the right after um, uh, Lavoie was killed, uh, there were a total of eight arrests. Uh, one, of the, or one of them was that John Rickheimer um, turned himself in in Arizona. The other seven happened in Oregon. The, those people, so when that original seven happened, I wrote a letter to all seven of them. Uh, the, those oh, are okay. Jason Patrick, Ryan Bundy, um, Hammond Bundy, Brian Cavalier, uh, Ryan Payne, Joseph, I still haven't figured out how to pronounce this guy's last name, Oshaugnessy. Um, Works for me. And <laughs> Sure, right, and, and Peter Santilli. So, uh, Joseph was was bailed out. So I actually, I, I, in a sense, I received two replies because the jail actually sent me back the letter to Joseph, and they said that they're not, uh, not deliverable to to forward. So they're so the jail and you know whatever. But the jail basically says we're not we're not going to forward this to wherever he ended up. But he bailed out. Um, Peter is the only one who I have received a reply from, and that ha and I received that on Wednesday. I should note I got the letter from. Uh, Peter on the same day as I got the return from the jail on, on Joseph. Oh, and what okay. that indicates to me is that it bounced back it come and, and happened the same day, right? Presumably, if, if they're forwarding it, it didn't sit in the jail, they would have sent it back the same day. So, basically, Peter, Peter probably received it on the day that he addressed the thing, which was February 9th, and then sent it, and then it took this long for it to get to me. Like, so, like maybe they do once a week mail. Here's the d weekly mail delivery and the weekly outro mail after we check in right. for contraband. Right. Ba basically, or, this is this is snail mail <laughs> on on steroids. So so right now it's Friday. Uh, hold on, hold on. Would it be would it be more like snail mail on like GMOs or a lot of carbs? <laughs> Is that the opposite then? Because we don't want it to be. No, dun, dun, yeah, dun. No, no comment on that. All but, right. Uh, <laughs> but um, so basically, with, with a is actually only the the third day that I theoretically could could have received a letter. So okay. he probably received received it, and then bam. I I wouldn't be surprised if if I get replies from um, uh, at least one or two more of them, and I will likely, you know, go back into it, try to figure out where all of these guys are now in the jail system and and send them each um, a letter as well as possible. I, I've got to figure out what to do. I may also send a follow-up uh, to Peter, particularly to the ones who are being held without bonds. So P Peter's basically it's been declared that he's got to stay there until trial, which as we just talked about, even for a small civil trial like mine, it, it takes like north of like a year. So you, you can probably have like Ten letters back and forth with with somebody like him during his uh, during. That's his true. Day. That's very that's very true. No, it's it's interesting that he wouldn't even have the opportunity to bail out. Did they did they say why? Are they saying it's a mm -hmm. flight risk, or did, did we get a right? So I, I can speak to that. So o only two of them uh, were able to bail out so far. Uh, those were Shauna Cox and Joseph. We'll just say O because it's uh, the last name being complicated. Joe O. Um, <laughs> the other ones, um, you know, basically, uh, the Bundys themselves, they're, they're never getting out, <laughs> or, or at least not in any time soon. And, and basically the logic being that they're the ringleaders, they led an armed occupation, 
there's no reason to think that they'd be compliant with law enforcement going forward. Uh, John Ritzheimer, although he willingly turned himself in, he wasn't arrested, he actually turned himself in after being charged, uh, they said that he affect, basically is mentally unstable um, in in the thing. They, they checked a box that you, you can read it, it's public online, that um, uh, basically doesn't deal well with law enforcement and, and has, you know, mentally unstable. Does, n- does not play well with others. His his kindergarten right. report card seems like they got an answer so, for everybody on this one. Go ahead. Right, the one on Peter was actually a little bit more nuanced. It was interesting. the The judge actually was presented by the prosecutor. The prosecutor actually quoted Peter as with the with the Hillary Clinton comment. The prosecutor actually brought up the fact that Peter once said that he'd shoot Hillary Clinton. Um, the judge actually rejected it. He said that well that particular thing. He said, while distasteful, I, I'm not considering it. But what he did consider was basically that um, his advocacy for noncompliance with law enforcement means that he probably wouldn't be able to uh, be receptive to pretrial services, right? When somebody is let out on bail, they don't just get to, like, go do whatever they want, right? He, he probably would have to wear an ankle bracelet. Many of them have to do right. uh, urine drug sample testing, things like that. And the judge actually specifically cited, I, I can't imagine it would be a pleasant experience for a cop to knock on his door and ask for a pee sample, right? This is a guy who, who gets in a fight with, with every cop that he talks to in sort of every interaction. How, like, how could we administer pretrial services for him? And the, the judge basically made the case. He doesn't think it, it's possible or, or logical to assume that uh, Peter would would comply with those things, and therefore that he has to be held. Um, uh, in yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm, my, I'm my under- good. My understanding is basically only only two of them so far have been granted uh, uh, the ability to bail out, and and it's unlikely that more of them will be able to bail out. Although, given the largeness of this situation, I wouldn't be surprised if again some of the lower level ones, particularly the ones who did bail out, were given. Uh, deals to the effect of we'll drop charges against you for you know testimony against you know the others. So we'll probably see a few of them start sprinkling out, but based on deals, not based on bail. Yeah, you know, and 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 there's been a lot of chatter. Once again, I I haven't made any ultimate determination, and I I don't necessarily pick a side in this. It's it, it's very similar to the, to Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin and these things, and and Freddie Gray. You know, th- there's so much that I don't know. You know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be the last person in the room to make a final stand. I still don't officially support a presidential candidate yet. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just I don't want to rush to judgment. So I'm not necessarily uh, supporting Pete Santilli, and I'm not necessarily condemning Pete Santilli. I'm interested to see how it plays out. But I can say that a lot of the chatter and a lot of the because I love reading the comments and all these stories and as as, as we're doing all of our research, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or what have you. A lot of people are curious to see if Pete Santilli uh, waves a magic wand and gets out scot-free and if he wasn't there as part of the the FBI move. A lot of people accuse him of being an undercover, being some sort of a narc. I, I don't know exactly... In, in what capacity, but the fact that he was live streaming so many of the, the, the details and the plans while he was there and that he got to Bundy Ranch so quickly, there's a lot of chatter about Pete's on the inside, he's working for them, and that's what brought him down. I'll bet you he bails out. He's going to turn. He's gonna go turncoat on these guys in a heartbeat. Now, like I said, I'm not saying that's what the way it is. I'm not saying that's not – I'm not saying that – Jeez, now I'm in the middle of one of those George Bush things. Fool me once, uh, can't can't fool me again. Uh, I mess up the quote so bad, but no, I'm I'm not I'm not saying that I believe that or disbelieve that. But there's a lot of chatter about that. Just wait and see if Pete Santilli uh, goes turncoat on everybody and and he goes scot free. Let's see what happens. He'll probably even get a new Cadillac out of it. I read all these comments, and it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting yeah. to to sift through and go hmm. Well, I guess we're gonna wait and see, aren't we? I have no idea. I don't know, you know. But there's a there's a lot of vitriol and a lot of finger pointing going on. It's a uh, it, it's it's a dynamic situation for sure. You know, I I think it's interesting because in his in his letter to me, he does somewhat distance himself from the Patriot movement. It could be a play towards that kind of thing. He but at, at the same time, his express uh, his expression of disappointment was 
based around the fact that they weren't participating enough. I right. mean, it seems like in some ways he's still kind of attached to the uh, cause of, of being there, but that he thinks that people didn't do well enough. That, that at least for the moment, it doesn't sound like he's banking on um, anybody. Uh, it doesn't sound like he's bank, banking on anybody trying to cut him a deal, right? He's still, he's still kind of skewing, kind of, you know, uh, the same sort of rhetoric that he did on the outside. And in a sense, he's, he's trying to still report from jail, but he's not the primary person receiving letters. You, you yeah. actually saw in, in the letter, right? twice both at the beginning and end he's like thanks so much for sending me a letter can more people send me letters <laughs> um, well you know what and, and of course you, you could imagine I mean you're you're living in the information age and all of a sudden you're thrown in you probably don't have uh, I, I suppose they don't have actually I have no idea how jails work do you even get outside communication is that a privilege and in, in, until you're processed uh, you don't get the opportunity to stay connected through phone phone calls or through internet through emails is that how it works phone calls tend to be and based on you know it can it's totally variable place to place and stuff like that it tends to be that phone calls are there's some specific time when they can make phone calls if they're in solitary confinement their ability to do that is greatly truncated um my understanding is that none of them right now are in solitary uh confinement there was a lot of advocacy surrounding the fact that Ammon was being held there um, I believe that Peter Santilli is in uh, general population just based on, on that uh, reporting. So presumably he's able to make phone calls, um, presumably, you know, but it's usually very expensive, right? The, the, the tolls uh, on a phone bill, either from inside or, you know, a person receiving a call from the inside, uh, that it tends to be just highly expensive. So there's a lot of barriers to it. The, the same thing is basically you have the perfect example of, of a monopoly situation where, you know, they, you know, the, their um, canteen or whatever can sell them papers, pen, stamps, whatever, but at a highly jacked up price because where else are they going to go? So for all I yeah, know, it's highway robbery. Like, Five dollars for a stamp. I, I'm not saying that that's the case. No, but but, but, but you're, you're barriers, very right though. Barriers to entry for for someone in jail to to be in correspondence with the outside. Well, you're very you're very right. I mean, the the, the prison industrial complex. It's it's uh, it's a money making racket. It's I actually have a buddy that that his previous job he used to be um, one of the guys that would supply. Um, well, just go down the whole list of all the stuff that is purchased by a prison, um, all the things in the cantina and whatnot. And I got some very interesting insight. That was years and years and years and years ago. Um, it's just insane. You can buy a track phone or something for 20 bucks, and it's like, just use the phone. Why should this be expensive? It's, anyway, now we're getting a little off tangent here. But t tell me, how, the, the, the letter, I know we've gone over a little bit of the highlights, but how did you start it off? How does it begin? Right, so in in my writing to him, and give me just one second, I can open up my original uh, letter to him. I say, I'm sure last month has been ra rather turbulent for you. And by the way, I actually, I, I think I only posted the questions on News to Share, so I actually, the, me, loud to you, this would probably be the first time anyone in the public has heard the beginning of my letter to him. Excellent. I'm sure the... I'm sure the last month has been rather turbulent for you. During that time, News to Share, a media outlet based out of Washington, D.C., has been watching the Oregon wildlife refuge situation very closely and reporting on it to the best of our ability. As it stands right now, thousands of viewers have been relying on, our, on us for coverage of the standoff and its aftermath. As a journalist, I'm sure you know that the public and media will now be dissecting the situation. If you have anything you'd like the public to know, please reply to this letter with a statement, information, or anything else you'd like to share. We will make sure it is presented unaltered to the public. And I did that, by the way. I, in addition to transcribing it and turning it into an interview in the way I formatted it, I also scanned his his letters and put it online, so you can see what he wrote to me, you know, verbatim um, in his handwriting. Um, you know, that's and that's good. I think uh, what was it? The Planned Parenthood videos. They said, "Oh no, no, no those were edited." Well, no, we we released the clips because you know, for the purposes of watching it, here are the, and then we'll also release the full version of here. You want to sift through seven hours of footage? Here you go. They, they right. have at I, it. It's not all compelling. In, in my case, I thought that that was uh, important, which is that you know, I transcribed uh, exactly what he wrote. But but for example, if there are discussions on. Uh, grammar, for example, such as he kind of write his handwriting is more or less in all caps. He writes like as if he's in cap lock. 
So like, for example, that I use my discretion to capitalize properly, things like that, right? If I'm changing even a little bit, I want people to see exactly what he, what he sent me. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the, the first uh, question that I, that I asked him, oh, well, actually, so he replied to that. His, his intro before it was, he said, thanks so much for reaching out and sending a letter. As you can imagine, daily mail call has become something very important to look forward to. Before I address your questions, I want to share the most critical information I can with you. My incarceration is in direct retaliation for my criticism of the U.S. government, particularly the FBI. My case is a true blue First Amendment case, and everyone in alternative media has a stake in the outcome. So, that, so that's sort of his thesis statement, right? He's basically leading in by saying uh, the whole thing is BS and and I'm being retaliated. Against. And, and... If you uh, what is that? If it, and first they came for the gypsies, but I wasn't a gypsy, and then they came for the trade unionists, <laughs> and I wasn't, a, and yeah. then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So like the very beginning of this is, hey, th- th- this is for all independent. How did he phrase that? Independent journalists or for he said, alternative my media? My case is a true blue First Amendment case, and everyone in alternative media. Alternative media. The outcome. Well, you know, I, in a I lot of these what, things. What yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say what I th- I think his his veiled comment there is that the media needs to stick with him because his case has ramifications for everyone else. I think basically what his, his, his subtext there is, report on me positively because, because if, you know, if you don't, if you make me look bad, then, then civil liberties can be compromised and it'll affect you too, is, is basically what his, his point is. Okay, okay. So, my first question to him was, you wore a vest labeling yourself press, but the FBI and other law enforcement agencies have labeled you as a participant, partially relying on your status as a member of Oath Keepers. Do you disagree with their characterization? Um, again, I'm not sure whether he read the criminal complaint against him that was released to the public, but uh, the FBI spends a lot of time uh, pointing out the instances in which he has called himself an Oath Keeper. There was a live stream in which he said that he was an Oath Keeper. He actually had like a badge of theirs and he tore it and he said being an oath keeper is like a concept and then he tore it and he said look i'm still an oath keeper and so the fbi said okay look quote peter santilli i'm still an oath keeper (laughs) um he also had on his press vest you can find photos of him he had a patch on his press vest that actually said domestic terrorist and he had another patch that said idaho three percent so that's basically and and the fbi cited all those things so that's basically where my question was coming from. His response was, yes, I always wear a vest labeled press because I am the free press as I report, broadcast the live stream from the various scenes I've covered. The FBI can do whatever they wish to mischaracterize me, but they don't set the standards, nor can they modify the First Amendment, which ultimately protects my role as I broadcast the truth. I'm not sure who other agencies are, but I can tell you, th- but I can tell you this, any agency which is doing the right thing, which is not doing the right thing, is unconstitutional or is unconstitutional is very fearful of my criticism. I have gone after many of them fearlessly. Their mischaracterization is mere retaliation against me for calling them out when they deserve it. As to relying on my members of, of the status of Oath Keepers, I'm not sure where you got that, but Stuart Rhodes has relied on my endorsement of his organization. You have it backwards, or someone does. The Oath Keepers relies on my good words. When I criticize them, Stuart R. panics. And so again, uh, he, he seems to be confused by that. I, I don't know whether he read the complaint against him, but but they they reference the FBI references him being an oath keeper uh, in their criminal complaint, which which also had local law enforcement involved, which was what I was referencing. Well, it's um, it sounds like in your uh, if if you should do a follow up, I, th- I think a clarification and a copy of the actual <laughs> yeah, report would be in order. To him. Maybe I'll send it. Yeah, I'll send, send him a him copy the of the report. Yeah, this is community. what I was that's referencing, and just so we're clear, that's why I, I was asking. I'm not sure if you had a chance to read this. Yeah, I mean, okay. Um, so my my second question was was simply, is there anything you would have done differently? Uh, you know, which is an interesting question to ask somebody in jail because you are, I've I've asked a number of people. This is something that you ask people all the time. Is there anything you would have done differently? Kind of in any story, uh, when you're asking that to someone in jail. The answer should be yes, uh, you know, unless that was the end goal. Um, he writes, would I have done anything differently? At this very moment, I'm extremely disappointed in the Patriot community. Knowing what I know now, I'm not sure I would have invested so much energy or had so much faith that the Patriots would rise peacefully to the call. When I get out, 
I don't think I'll be doing very much in terms of, ra- of ha- uh, rallying patriots because I'm not sure if Americans really want to do anything about saving our country. Sounds sad, but it's truly how I feel. So this is where he's sort of disassociating himself, but on the basis of their uninvolvement, not on the basis of uh, involvement. So in a sense, he's already acknowledging that to some degree he is affiliated with them, right? Uh, he kind of, in his previous answer on the first thing, he said, I'm pressed, I'm First Amendment, da 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 but he doesn't say that that's contrary to being uh, a member of the militia. In his mind, exercising your First and Second Amendment rights are very, uh, not only simultaneous and not mutually exclusive, but to him they're very connected. His right to uh, be a part of a militia movement is to him inextricably linked to his right to be a member of the press. That's not how most law enforcement sees it. Um, moving forward, I ask, having spent exclusive, extensive time with the militia very closely as a member of the press, do you think there's anything the public or the media misunderstand or misrepresent about what's happened over the past month? He starts by replying, the militia, in quotes, and then a colon, end quote. Please share this with everyone. And then he writes in all caps, and he underlines it. This is important to him. <laughs> he writes, please share this with everyone. We are all the militia. It's so important for everyone to understand this. Read the Federalist Papers to understand exactly what our founding fathers intended with the Second Amendment as it related to the militia. It was very specific. So, again, he's citing the Second Amendment not simply as a right, but as an obligation, and that he considers that very, very connected with uh, his his journalism. Um, my next question, or my final question, was, what do you want the public, particularly those who disagree with the occupiers' actions, to know about the group's actions and motivations? He said in quotes, to people who disagree with occupiers' actions, one, trespassers who walked into the refuge and made themselves comfortable didn't deserve to die. None of them. Uh, that quote has been, that, that's been a quote that a lot of organizations that have reposted this on social media or elsewhere have, have attached to. Um, I had even the generally more liberal uh, coffee party media uh, posted it on Facebook, and that's the quote that they used, right? The, the, it's sort of an appeal to everybody. Nobody likes when somebody dies, no matter if you agree with them or disagree with them. And then that's basically what his next thing was. He said, agree or disagree, goes with the theme of, of your show here, it doesn't change the core constitutional principles they stood for. He writes, the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, which states very specifically what the U.S. government can or can't do with respect to land. So you could have 100,000 people who disagree with how they took over the refuge, and 10 people saying Article 1, sec- Section 8, Para 17, says the government can't own a refuge, and, and it belongs to the country and the state. I would have to side with the 10 people. <laughs> this is where his, his language gets a little less formal. I would have to side with the 10 people and the U.S. Constitution and ignore the 100,000 whiny but hurt fake patriots who complain about the style or cleanliness in how we restore constitutionality. (laughs) And then he wrote, not in response to any particular question, he wrote, always remember, I came here with a megaphone, camera, and my mouth. People at the FBI can't stand how truthful I am, so they threw me in jail to silence me. And then he wrote, I, but he meant it, will only make me louder. (laughs) And I think that's a very interesting note for him to end on, is that in his mind, he is still protesting this uh, in from jail, right? He's no longer, you know, a part of the armed people, uh, but he is, but he's sitting there and he's continuing to send out letters saying, uh, I was doing the right thing and people should rise up, uh, etc. And that this will only make him louder. It's a very um, protestant conclusion to his letter. And inter- fascinatingly, he, he concluded with uh, Semper Fidus, um, Peter Santilli, and so I'm, I'm sure most of your audience would know this, but Semper Fi is, basically means always faithful, and, and it's mostly used as a military slogan. Peter Santilli, uh, before he was uh, against all things government, he was the quintessential part of the government, which is the uh, military. He was, he was formerly a Marine. Um, so it very much goes with his uh, theme as a perpetual member of the Oath Keepers, uh, that, he would, that he would conclude his letter with, with Semper Fi. Fun fact, 
uh, less than about a year ago, Pete Santilli reached out to me um, because I, you know, like I said, I interviewed him at Bundy Ranch and uh, maybe an occasional back and forth, and then not, not very much. But then kind of out of the clear blue sky, I got a message from him <clears throat> um, asking if I would be able to go out and uh, cover the one-year anniversary, if you will, of the, the Bundy Ranch. He, he was in uh, C- Cincinnati and um, kind of went back and forth on the possibility of I, I hadn't considered it. And, and I was like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, pfft, maybe. And so I talked it over with Blake Wally, um, who lives out in Vegas. Um, he's who I went with last time, and we, it, it just it didn't work out logistically. But you know th- that's that's essentially um, another interesting fun fact about Pete and I. He <laughs> he wanted me to be a correspondent to go out there to do the the one year thing because he couldn't make it. Um, wow. So so he's in there now, and and you guys had a chance to go through all of this stuff. You, you, what is your main takeaway in in his tone and tempo? Is it that? Uh, or his spe- specificity in his in his in his answers. What what is your right? You know, it's been a couple days now. You, you've had time to process it, think about it. What is the main takeaway for you? I think what I get out of it is that he perhaps sincerely believes, or at least his message to everybody regarding what he is, is that he believes that it is not mutually exclusive to be. An, an activist affiliated with a militia group while simultaneously being uh, a journalist. And so I personally will not pass judgment on whether or not that that's true, but it, but it poses uh, a lot of sort of philosophical uh, questions, right? You have Aristotle yeah. said that man is, a, uh, man is political. Hum, humans are, are political creatures by nature. So, you know, maybe he's just being human. But uh, he gets himself deep into these issues, right? His, his defense attorney speaking in, in court said he's just a ragtag, uh, in-your-face journalist and that it's just the way he speaks, that it's just his reporting when he tells people to uh, show up there with, with guns and aid them, whereas the prosecutors were saying him putting on a vest that says press is about the only press-like thing he did. Hmm. Um, you know, the, it's an interesting dichotomy because... It is. Uh, in in some sense, he's using the tools of the press, such as live streaming and and radio um, and and cameras. He's using those tools for for advocacy. Um, he's using the press press's toolbox rather than the militiaman's toolbox, rather than guns, to to present a message. Um, does that make him a journalist, or does that make him uh, a militant with journalist tools? And that's a question that I can't answer. His, he seems to insist that the answer is that he can validly do both. Well, this is this is an inter- This is perhaps the most interesting. Um, let's just say one of the most interesting components to this entire story. Now, let 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 let's break this down and, and examine this for just another second here. Uh, George Stephanopoulos is is he ever had any affiliation with the Democratic Party? To your knowledge? Well, he he donated to the Clinton Foundation. I, is what I think you're going to get at. <laughs> so so is he allowed to then be a journalist? Sure. Or is he so, too affiliated? This is a big issue. Of course, journalists have uh, uh, conclusions their own, right? You know, a, a, theoretically, the perfect journalist uh, completely lets that not influence how they how they do it. I I have beliefs that are very uh, that that are not that secret. You can go onto Facebook and you can find that I'm generally speaking a relatively uh, libertarian individual. That said. If you if you went on news to share and had no knowledge of who I am, you you would not find that from my reporting, right? What I what I write is is always I completely remove my opinion from it. In the case of the Santilli letter, I just put it up exactly as is. I didn't write, and then he spoke these words of truth. Look at his letter, or and I didn't write, and he's completely wrong. Look at what he said. I let other people do that, including other journalists, including uh, someone like yourself. It doesn't necessarily make somebody not a journalist to have an opinion. I think the question is, how far can that go? Can and I, to me, a very what I think a very common standard is: is are they actually changing the story? Are they anal, are they analyzing it from their point of view? Right? You're you're you obviously have a point of view that you uh, talk about on here, and and you help people understand that, particularly people who might be sympathetic to your viewpoint or people who could have your viewpoint. 
you're analyzing it, but you're not necessarily changing the course of history other than making the public more informed. The difference with him, and he doesn't seem to uh, believe that this crosses uh, a line, but many people would place the line at, are you actually sort of intentionally changing or provoking the story? And an allegation that I have seen of his, which I'm not necessarily endorsing, but an allegation I've seen about him is that if he gets to a destination and there isn't a story, he turns it into a story. That, that he would in, that he inflames the situation by saying we need more weaponry here, um, and and therefore hmm. injects himself into it. And while that doesn't necessarily make him a criminal, it does make him a non-journalist in in the minds of of critics. And so I I, w- I would love for people to tweet at me, tweet at Brian at the New American Media, tell us what <laughs> tell us what you think about it. I'm, I'm I really am interested in what the public has to say about this issue. And since reporting on it, I've gotten messages, uh, phone calls, uh, and comments on Facebook, um, uh, both in favor of and, and against him. I, I would actually say that so far people have contacted me. It's kind of a 50-50 split of, of either he's the worst thing ever or, or we support him unequivocally. Um, so it's very interesting to, to see that conversation. I'm not going to pass judgment because in my opinion, or at least in my, um, way of reporting, I don't, it's not my job to analyze, but there are people for whom it is their job to analyze, and, and the public is part of that. Well, um... <laughs> what do you think? What do I think? Well, it, it, a couple of things. So, you know, I do a, I do a sports show called uh, The Unhappy Hour, raised outside of Cleveland, Ohio, Indians, Cavs, and Browns fan. Um, I've never celebrated a championship in any of those three major sports in my entire existence. So that's 36 years times three sports. It's kind of statistically more unlikely that this team could be this consistently bad than it is that they could accidentally occasionally be good. Um, To paraphrase Mike Polk Jr., the comedian. Um, Now, Los Angeles just got the the Los Angeles Rams. It's a story that just came up a month or two ago, right? Uh, San Francisco, uh, uh, St. Louis, uh, the team is moving out to Los Angeles. Now, I am a Cleveland Browns fan, but am I allowed to be a Rams fan with this new team coming in? Am I allowed to root for them? Well, part of me says no, because when the Cleveland Browns were stolen and they went to Baltimore, uh, they won two Super Bowls over there, and I'm never going to support a team that leaves their fan base high and dry. It's total BS. I I hate it. I can't stand it. I don't like that. However, the Rams are from L.A., so they're coming back, but that's not quite accurate either because they started in the 1930s in Cleveland. They started in the 1930s as the Cleveland Rams, then went to L.A. and then went to San Fr- uh, St. Louis and then back to L.A. So the reason I say all that, other than to bore the people that don't understand sports, and I'm just speaking Klingon right now, and for the non-nerds, that's some nerdy language from I, I understood uh, uh, the Star Trek reference better than I understood the sports references. But continue. Ah, that's awesome. I was so hoping it was going to play out that way. That is, that's epic. That's perfect. Um, but my, the reason I bring that up is because, okay, so, so say you, you have literature from Oath Keepers because you met them at, at uh, Occupy LA. First thing it says is we are not a militia, but then you read a definition. Another definition of militia says a body of citizens organized in a paramilitary group and typically regarding themselves as defenders of individual rights against the presumed interference of the federal government. Um, so once again, militia, not a dirty word, but they also say they're not a militia. So what if we're not members of anonymous, but sympathetic toward anonymous, or we've been to Occupy LA, but we're not in the Occupy movement. What if you've been to a Black Lives Matter rally? What if you're on a Black Lives Matter mailing list? Are you still allowed to be a journalist? Um, who was it? Nancy Pelosi and some of these other clowns, Boxer Fine. I think it was Feinstein. I did a show a couple years ago, and Diane Feinstein was was really mocking the people in alternative media, saying, "Oh, well, if the, you don't qualify for media, you're not real media." It's like, what? You mean you? haven't bribed them to say your version of the story, so you're trying to downplay our role and our importance. But the, the re- basically, Ford, what I'm saying is they're charging Pete Santilli partially, at least some of these areas that they've thrown out there, because of his affiliation with Oath Keepers, which, by the way, is not a militia. Um, <laughs> but, you know, 
Do, Ford, are you sympathetic right. toward any sort of activist groups? Are you a unofficial or official member of any activist groups? You don't necessarily need to answer, but I'll toss it to you. <laughs> um, I yeah. So I, there's a there's a, a, quite a few things to to unpack in what you said. I I would start on the there there example, usually is. That's say, why I do it. Go ahead. Journal. So you you had the sports example. Are you are you allowed to report on sports and and root for a team? Uh, rooting for a team is probably uh, comparable to just being a journalist with a political angle. Fo- people w- so people would say whether Fox News is good journalism or bad journalism, but most people would consider Fox News journalism of some kind, uh, but obviously has a political spin. Sean Hannity does not make any secret out of the fact that he's uh, a conservative. That's probably I could probably liken that to uh, rooting for a team. What would not be considered necessarily journalistic or at least journalistically objective would be if Sean Hannity were to actually uh, let's say you know run run for Congress while still being a uh, journalist or in in the extreme if he were to show up at Bundy Ranch and and you know we actually know that Sean Hannity carries a gun because he talks about it yeah. Sean Hannity shows up with a gun and he says I'm armed I'm, I'm contributing to this but I'm still uh, on the Sean Hannity show right that well, well he did show up my... to Bundy Ranch. Actually, we talked to his producers. He was th- it was through right. satellite dish, but he did show up and give an sure. interview. I was right next to Clive, and when when he was talking with Sean on the phone. But anyway, sure. I get your point. But he was, and and even if he, and even if he's sympathetic to them, I don't think that he that that Sean Hannity necessarily compromised whether or not he's a journalist. And I'm also not necessarily saying that Peter Santilli did, but I'm saying that it's an interesting question, but that, but... and it's a question which he's addressed and which mm-hmm. other people would. But then by but Go then by him covering the story and putting it out there, that brought more people out to the Bundy Ranch, which is activism. Um, so some, this is some where I think say. it gets this is where it gets into a very interesting place. They're talking about something, in my opinion, is not necessarily going to be um, simply reporting on some topic, right, and focusing on it. For example, Fox News will focus on on certain issues and MSNBC will focus on certain issues when ju- simply by virtue of reporting on them by reporting on their beat they're not proclaiming support for that thing I- I've had more access to the Bundy stuff than I have to other other things that doesn't change whether or not I have an opinion on them or how we're um, you know talking about uh, all those sorts of things Sean Hannity showing up at at your your Bundy situation doesn't necessarily mean that Bundy is announcing his support for you, nor that he's announcing his support for uh, the uh, opposing side in, in that okay, case. Okay, okay, but but it's with a wink and a nudge that he's not doing it. Come on. <laughs> right? right. I, I mean, I mean, let, let's just let, let's just put all our cards. Let's flip. What, what is that, that that game where you play poker, but you slap him on your forehead and you can't see it, but you can see... Look, all the cards right. go face up. We, we all moved all our chips in. Let's, let's play our cards face up here. It's with a yeah. wink and a nudge that he's not encouraging people to go out there and rally to support. It's a wink and a nudge. He didn't do anything. Do you mean, do you wink, mean Hannity or, San, or Santilli? Does it make a difference? I, a theoretical person doing there, something I similar. I think that there, but but we can't just entirely be theoretical. I think that the the issue on Santilli, or and the, and I'm you know quoting FBI indictment here or the criminal complaint. They were pointing out they out and they used as evidence. And, they, and by the way, they weren't using this as evidence that this specific thing was a criminal act. They're not saying it's a crime to be a member of Oath Keepers. They were using him as a member of Oath Keepers to show we don't believe he's press. We believe that he was a participant in occupying. They're, they're essentially proving that he was an occupier. Oh, interesting. But, so they're not saying, oh, him being a militiaman is a crime, because that is constitutionally protected. They were saying this is evidence that he was there participating in the occupation, that what he was doing was no different from what Ammon or Ryan was, were doing. It wasn't a judgment on whether or not he's a bad journalist. It was just saying, we don't think he was there exercising his First Amendment rights exclusively. We think he was participating in it and putting on a bulletproof uh, press vest doesn't make him uh, um, charge-proof. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I like that visual. It's it's a, it's like some kind of superhero moment there. I don't know if it's Deadpool or uh, Batman versus <laughs> Superman, but there's something in there. There's there's some sort of joke that could be made by a funnier person than me. Sorry, it made me laugh. Right. Um, but, yeah. That ba- basically that he's that he's not invincible. But what they were citing was that 
he wasn't like John Hannity showing up and, and a wink and a nudge. They quoted Santilli in both situations saying, we need muscle and firearms out here. He, they, they cited him telling people to come and that his order for coming, while not a crime in and of itself, shows that he was a participant rather than just a person who was there. Basically, the hmm. FBI was presuming, if you're there right now, we know that there's no hostages, nobody's being held against their will. If you're there right now, you're an occupier, and therefore you are part of the conspiracy to impede federal officers, which was exactly what the charge was. And so them, knowing that a grand jury could look at it and say, well, wait, isn't he a journalist? They, they spent most of their time saying, okay, we've already explained why all of the participants are, are bad. Here's why preemptively him being a journalist isn't a defense, at least in the eyes of the law. That was what the FBI spent most of their time on his on. And basically, at least in their, in their uh, criminal complaint, they made it seem as if he was more or less indistinguishable from the rest of them, except for the fact that he wore a vest, but that he was, basically, he was considered by those people to be a part of it. And to some degree, they haven't really helped his uh, case in that the, the Bundy Ranch Facebook page, which has actually shared this letter on the page now, um, they, they basically said, he's a patriot. We, we, we ally ourselves with him. They've, they've imprisoned him wrongly, right? The, basically, every step of the way, the Bundys and uh, Santilli have affiliated themselves with each other. It is a two-way relationship. And so the FBI is saying, not that that in itself is a crime, but that shows that he's not exempt somehow, that he doesn't get some kind of uh, ex extra press uh, privilege that, that indemnifies him from being a participant. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Interesting. I, I don't, I don't Again, know how they can... my point of Right, view. no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not assuming... I'm not. I'm, I'm not assuming that. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not trying to push that out there either. I don't believe that. Um, th that you are. It, it's just. It, it's just interesting because how, how do you take away the years and years and years that he's been doing all of his shows? Like he's clearly a journalist. He's clearly a, a radio guy. Like he's clearly he has the he has the resume to show. You know, and there, and there may be some disputed areas along that resume. No need to get into that again. But. How could somebody possibly look at all of the years and years of stuff that he's done and say, oh, he's not really a guy that, you know, goes on and talks about current events and, and covers breaking news stories? He clearly is. I, I just, I, I don't see how, well, he was there. He was there and there were things going on. So he was, I, I, I don't know. I can, I can, I can see a little bit of this from both sides. It's, uh... No, I, I don't know if, that it's like some, some ma magic amulet or something from Lord of the Rings where, <laughs> you know, he, he puts on the press badge and it's like he can get away with whatever. I, I, I don't know. I mean, was he aiming guns at people? Was he? Th w w I'm, I'm just trying to like, I, I didn't see all of the footage, um, but, but from some of the things I did see, he was calling for, for, for it seemed like he was... Um, not Stockholm Syndrome necessarily, where you kind of take on the traits of your captors. Obviously, this was voluntary. But maybe, I don't know. I don't know if you have to be a certain way to gain the trust of people so that you can get the access, so that you can report the story. I don't know if that's an act or if that is legitimate. I don't know if you're right. allowed to cover a story and believe in the cause simultaneously. Are you? Are you not? The, the, there's a lot of nuances when you peel back the layers of the onion on this one, and I and I think we're we're kind of landing on it right about now. There, there there are some definite nuances and questions that have that have come up with alternative media. Um, and this, this is actually this, this is part of what's what's fascinating in all of these. It does circle us back to even in the case of of my own being detained in, in Baltimore. Right, right. Um, you know, and again, not, not comparing myself and him, but I, but I remember very specifically that the, when I was asked, where, let's see your credentials, right, basically right before it happened, and I, I uh, showed my credentials, I said right there, Andrew Fisher, which my, my legal name is Andrew Fisher, uh, for his nickname, um, right there, Fort Andrew Fisher News to Share, and the National Guardsman satisfied, he looked at the credential, he said, he's credentialed media, and he says that to the cop who's behind me, who then pushes me on I the ground, care. and the words out of the cop's mouth were, I don't care. I don't Fam care. Famously, Daniel, I, Officer Daniel, I don't care, Herschel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, 
I, I, I believe, and so I don't really want to, I, I wouldn't necessarily testify specifics about things that aren't on video, but there, there were things kind of walking up there, for, walking from that spot back to where the press and the paddy wagon and everything were all set up. Um, as we were talking, part of, really part of his, his justification for the arrest was he doesn't, oh, if I don't know the news outlet, then are they really news? I, my guess is that if I said Ford Fisher, CNN, <laughs> that they're not going to, that they're not going to, um, do something like that. And in the case of, of, um, Oregon, right, CNN was there, MSNB, or MSNBC was reporting on it. I don't know if they had a camera there. NBC was there. Um, and they were trying to tell people, they were like, press, get out. And the arrest, actually happened after they had said um, they had said to the press basically the press needs to leave if you're still there after XYZ date and this was before the uh, Finnegan shooting um, they said if you're still there then you're an occupier and is the, many people would obviously question is it fair for them to just say that can, can they just tell people we're preemptively saying that you're not a member of the press if you stay um, but basically, that's what the FBI tried to do, and it, it actually wasn't really part of their criminal complaint. They didn't want to rely on that, as the, the absence of him leaving doesn't make makes him not a journalist, because pre- plenty of journalists have embedded with people, and I don't think that a journalist, you know, if CNN really wanted to be there, I don't think it would make CNN less of a journalist to not comply with that order. But basically, they, they partially relied on that by saying, if you don't leave, you're part of them. Peter Santilli doesn't leave. They say, "Oh, well, you're part of him," and then they and then they make the the case for that uh, after they grab him. It's weird. By the way, while we were talking, I I pulled up. Um, it's it it was called a First Amendment area that they put up in Bundy Ranch, and it shows uh, this this uh, little uh, orange mesh with a couple of stakes pounded in the ground. It's it's like they they tried to pin the people in like cattle at the cattle ranch. I mean, it just absolutely ridiculous. I usually call that a press pen. <laughs> a press pen. Yeah. Um, it, 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 this is almost as rich as, uh, you know, the, trying to put people in like cattle at the cattle ranch. It's almost as good as the Pope saying you need to build bridges and you look at the Vatican's 1,000 foot high w- battle fortress walls around the Vatican. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, give yeah. me a break. Anyway, but yeah, it's... it's um, I, I just shared that, and I'm going to share it again because it, it's dangerous. If someone says you got to go, well, no, I don't. I'm press. I just told you you need to go. We got a problem there, you know. Yeah, Ford. This is it's a it's a tricky new world. I, and once again, I, I'm not anti-police. I know a lot of people in this liberty movement are anti-cop, anti-police. I'm and I'm not saying that you are necessarily. I'm not going there. I, I'm right. not anti-cop at all. Um, that has got to be one of the most difficult jobs in the world, hands down. Every person you meet could be trying to kill you, and you're a target because of who you are. Um, for for the madmen, let alone you know the, the the sociopaths that have time to plot and plan things on top of it. Um, you know, if if I were trying to contain an area and protect the general public. You know, and I got a thousand people saying I'm press, I'm press, I'm press. Well, you know, how how do you handle a, a riot situation like Baltimore, and and how do you coexist with press if you don't know the people that are running with you and you're going down alleys? I saw that video. You're running with these police down alleys and streets, and you know the the sirens are blazing and they're going after people, and you're just running there along with them, and they're going, who the f is this guy? What the hell is this guy doing? Oh, he's press. The F he's press. I don't know if he's press. He could be press. Maybe he's going to press a gun to my temple as soon as I turn around. I don't want him writing it right around. I mean, and that's the thing where they say you can't impede an investigation. You're, you're interfering with our investigation. You're too close. I need you to back up. And, of course, then they abuse that, and I need you to back up around the corner, and then we're going to go pen you in. Um, it, man, it's a, it's a, I'm not really sure where this line is, Ford. Is, is it... Is there something more cut and dry that I'm I'm dancing around or just missing here, or is it a little more nuanced and complicated than uh, some people in the liberty movement want to make it? Where it's like, no, we got unlimited rights to everything, man. If you're my way, you're a pig, and you should, do-. you know, it's like, come on, guys. It, so 
I don't know. Am I... I think that the, it really good. So we're circling around. I think it's probably a good place to conclude on soon, which is that it, it truly is the new American media, which is that <laughs> there is an increasingly uh, spectrumatic, um, uh, non-binary sort of system for for people, you know, with cameras, right? If everybody's the press, does that make nobody the press? I, I would use anecdotally that... Uh, you know, I've had several situations like this in D.C. I, I have congressional press credentials, um, which which makes some difference and are kind of considered the gold standard in D.C. that every journalist carries their congressional cred. But um, and you know, I've been pushed back. There was a there was a hostage situation that I was filming at, and there was a cop who who wanted me to stay a block away from the police line. So like, they actually had a line, and I was standing at the, like I was respecting their line, which was already kind of far away. Yeah. He's like, you have to stand a block away from the line. And I had him on the live stream saying that. I, I got his name and badge number. I looked him up. It turns out he's actually still a cop, but six months ago he defrauded the the school system in D.C. and is being sued by the city for for uh, $200,000, and he's still a cop. For allegedly? Allegedly. It's total, totally a side thing, but maybe just a little bit salty about that cop making me go too far from the building so I couldn't see anything. Right. Anyway, the thing I was going to say about D.C., D.C. actually used to have, until about a year ago, they used to actually issue police issued uh, press credentials. You oh, could okay. actually have a card that says D.C. Metro like certified press, where the, you'd actually have a cop, like card issued by cops that you would show to cops and it's supposed to, and it says on the card basically like grant me leniency because I'm the press and and I'm registered with co I'm basically cop approved press and it used to be that they would actually have a measure for that then as of as of a little over a year ago I think it was November 2014 they stopped issuing those and let all the old ones expired and their logic was uh, basically there's n it's totally subjective now because everybody has a camera phone so everyone will just apply for them and it makes them worthless and basically they really they did this press release that said um, don't worry we're just going to respect everybody's rights equally um, oh that's a Bernie which Sanders is, socialist who will equally <laughs> circle the toilet uh, give me a break right. yeah yeah you we'll, we'll all equally have Equally yeah. nothing access uh, to, <laughs> to the news. You may all share a little bit of nothing. You, or, or put another way, you will all have the same size jail cell if you get too close to the police. Oh line. man, it's it, it, man, it's rich. It is rich. It, it's it, it's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting day we're living in, and I think you did, did just nail it, Ford. Uh, this is the new American media. The, the, the quote I just wrote down from you, if everybody is the press, does that make nobody the press? And, and that's kind of where we're at. We're through the looking glass. We're in the Superman bizarro world. Um, but I kind of like it. I, I like to think that Benjamin Franklin would love to be around right now. I like to think that... Uh, uh, Thomas Paine would love to be around right now, and it's it. We, may you live in interesting times, Ford Fisher. It uh, <laughs> this is an interesting. I, I have time. to say because you just mentioned Thomas Paine, uh, my girlfriend Malia was reading right next to me. She was reading Common Sense, like for for like a school thing. She was reading Thomas Paine, and she said, "Ford, he sounds a lot like you." <laughs> <laughs> my life. Thomas Paine sounds a lot like you. Oh, that's classic. Well, she hey, said it completely in earnest. This happened <laughs> yesterday, so I just um, had to mention that when you said that. No, that's that is that is such a perfect way to bookend this because now, literally bookending it, talking about books. I, I pulled up Pete Santilli's show on YouTube for the people that are out there that are interested. It says here, um, this is in his own words from uh, what? Is, how do you pronounce that? Malt 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 Noma County Jail. Um, Pete talks about why he was arrested, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so here's some information. If you would like to write Pete while he's being held as a political prisoner in Oregon, here is the address. 11540. What is that? Capital N, capital E. Uh, I just want to correct. I have the letter in front of me. 1150. I think you just said 1154. I think I heard a four in there, but I, I have his actual letter in front I'm so, of me. I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Did I catch a niner in there? Did I catch a niner in there? <laughs> Sorry, now I'm quoting like um, uh, 
what is that, Billy Madison or something? Uh, no, Tommy Boy. Did I catch a Niner in there? No, I, well, uh, on this on this page it says Peter Santilli, 11540 NE uh, Inverness Drive, Portland, Oregon, 97220. That's what it, it says on his page. Maybe his page is wrong or who knows how it works. But I, I would just say to anyone online, I, I would check it out. I'm, I'm looking at his, his own handwriting in front of me and it's written differently. So to anybody listening to this, just confirm it online. What I have is, tell me if you have the same ID number. What I have on his, as his ID number, where he wrote, from political prisoner, P. Santilli, ID number 7950711. Correct. Yeah, 7950711. Um, but, but it's also saying uh, he's able to accept books ordered and shipped by Amazon to the jail directly, but they have to be paperback. They must be paperback. Who knows? Maybe send him some common sense by Thomas Paine. Uh, give him a paperback <laughs> version of that. And it also says... Uh, Deb is out there and trying to stay in Oregon, and it's going to be difficult. So if you want to help him out, uh, direct to PayPal, peter at petersantilli.com, if you were so inclined to do such a thing. So I'll tell you what, man, I'm very interested. I, I, I commend your your efforts, Ford. Um, as I explained earlier in the program, you and I had been talking off air for a while about this as soon as it broke and kind of following it. And uh, you re- you really stayed on top of it and kept going. And I, I guess um, you know as we get some more details and some more updates here, um, I-, I I I'm just gonna assume that you're gonna go ahead and send him a copy of what you were referencing in that 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 letter, the charge, the the official charges against him, and maybe a follow up round to just kind of keep things going here, because you you seem to have a nice little inside a uh, little bit of inside access uh, to, right. to, to to gather some more information on this story. And I don't think it's over. I mean. Cliven's arrested, and so is Ammon, and whatever. But you know, with the BLM uh, claiming to to have ownership rights over so much land, when so many people dispute that in the Constitution they have the right to own nothing outside of a couple post offices and what, like ten miles around DC or something like that. I don't think <laughs> yeah. that this issue is going to be going away anytime soon. So uh, I just want to say, good work. I, I'm 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 glad that you followed through on this, and uh, you know. We, we we gotta keep on top of this stuff with the new American media, um, and it it takes all of us working together. You know, we don't have million dollar budgets, and we don't have uh, uh, vast vast teams of people that we can point and direct to become minions. But the, the beautiful part is, with the new American media, with news to share, with with social media. People are volunteering, and you can empty a swimming pool pretty quick if a thousand people each grab a bucket of water. Um, and I, I, I like the direction of where media is going, even though if everybody's the press, does that make nobody the press? It's, it's, it's a very interesting component of the story, something we're going to follow moving forward. So, Ford Fisher, thank you again for joining us here on Agree to Disagree. Any final thoughts, and would you like to remind everybody where they can check out your webpage and stay connected with you? Sure. Um... As, as a very final thought, I would just say that none of these issues are black and white, and none of them exist in a vacuum. So, for better or for worse, as this stuff has been happening, it has been bringing the issue of land into the forefront. Um, while virtually no uh, politician will say that they endorse what's going on there, just yesterday, I saw an ad released by Ted Cruz saying that he would return all federal land to states wow. and private citizens um, in June, which is before before this incident, but but following the Cliven one. Um, Rand Paul privately met with Cliven Bundy for an hour, and he also publicly was asked a question by uh, Ryan Bundy and replied that he similarly would return all land to the, to the state. Although it will be very fascinating to see how the criminal prosecution of these participants goes down. What I think is not totally unlikely is that in the next, and it's not going to be soon, but in the next five, ten years, you're going to see more disputes based on this issue, right? But sparked by this movement, you will see more political action taken, you know, through the quote-unquote proper channel uh, that will deal with the issue of federal land management. It's a, it's a fascinating issue. It's an issue that has become much more fascinating uh, as a result of, of people using arms to defend it rather than traditional democratic change. Uh, as to where you can find uh, my work, so my name is Ford Fisher, F-O-R-D-F-I-S-D-H-E-R. I am on Facebook, uh, and I'm also on Twitter, at Ford Fisher, and then Facebook, just my name. Uh, news to Share, you can uh, find us at News2, the number 2, share.com. 
on Twitter. We are news at news underscore two underscore share. And on Facebook, we're news, again, the number two share. And so the entire letter, both in a transcribed format and a scan of the letter itself, is available um, on on uh, our website. Uh, there's also a story about it on Mint Press News and, you know, a few other sites have been permeating it uh, around. And uh, I invite anybody to look at it. Send me your comments. Comment on this. Comment everywhere. You know, get the discussion going because these are fascinating issues and there's no one right answer. Absolutely. And uh, don't forget, I, I believe it's uh, tomorrow at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. Ford is going to publish the Klingon transcription of the letter. It will be broadcast. It will be transmitted <laughs> in Klingon, everybody. Just kidding. All right, Ford, thank you again, man. I appreciate your time. Good work. Keep it up. We'll stay in touch. And you have a great weekend. We'll talk again soon, all right? You got it. Talk to you later. Take care. Yeah. Good. It's just, just good stuff. Really, we all have to stay on top of these stories. So please... Check us out, thenewamericanmedia.com. On the right-hand side is our Facebook feed, or you can do a search for The New American Media with spaces in between and like the page. Underneath the Facebook feed is our Twitter feed. We're at American underscore media underscore. Subscribe, youtube.com slash thenewamericanmedia. And we're also on, oh, man, I don't know, Snapchat and Instagram and all the uh, Periscope. Find us, link up. We'll talk to you again soon. I appreciate you. I love you. Stay safe. Peace. Hi, everybody. You're listening to Agree to Disagree with Brian Engelman, and this is John B. Wells reminding you that not only is Brian Engelman a cool guy, and not only is the newamericanmedia.com a very cool platform, but here's a cool idea for you, too. Are you alone? Not really. Do you like dogs? Do you like cats? You do. Of course you do. Everybody does. One or the other, maybe even both. You know, there are a lot of dogs and cats that are at shelters right now, and if somebody doesn't take them home, they're going to wind up euthanized. That's a nice way of saying they're going to be killed because there's simply not enough room. I guarantee it, the best dogs and the best cats, the best pets, come from shelters. There's something about dogs and cats they know. They know where they are. You walk through one of them, and certainly at least one is going to look at you and go, I wish you'd take me home. I'm in hell. Please take me out of here. It'll be the best thing that you ever did for your soul. You'll feel good about it. And not only that... But you have a friend for life. doesn't matter if you got money, you don't have money. What well, doesn't make any difference to a dog or a cat. All they need is the sound of your voice and maybe even the stroke of your hand, and they're fine. Maybe a little food every once in a while. The sweetest sound that those pets ever hear is your voice. Think it over and adopt a cat or a dog from a local shelter today. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did.